you know, it's interesting when you look at, you know, the FDA approved cannabinoids here, you know, and how they interact with the cannabinoid system. You're right. I get the same thing. Well, yes, I, I was prescribed dronabinol, which is a THC synthetic derivative, and it wasn't effective. And, you know, now I'm starting to see cancer patients who are placed on this dronabinol, which is incredibly expensive. It's like $1,000 a month for them to have 2.5 to 5 milligrams of THC. And I have a patient right now who has schizoaffective disorder who is placed on Marinol. And she's actually at high risk for, you know, depression and suicidal ideation on Dronabinol. Like she should be on cannabis. Exactly. Um, she should be on the plant because it's a partial agonist at CB1, whereas Dronabinol is a full agonist. And that's where you have these potential increased side effects that can be really harmful to patients and you know it's like the other nurse practitioner the physician are like what okay. Connection. Alles über Cannabinoide in Österreich. welcome to the show Eloise and Carrie how are you, do how are you guys you. doing good how are you I'm great I'm great uh, well First of all, thank you so much for taking your time. I'm really excited to have this talk with both of you because I think it's, an, it, it's a talk or discussion that it's overdue, uh, especially um, in regards to the situation in Austria or Europe, European Union, um, in connection with um, the, uh, you know, the scandalous uh, situation with, with uh, medical cannabis and uh, especially even CBD. Um, first of all, uh, again, thank you so much for taking your time. Welcome to the show. I'll try to make a short introduction of both of you. And if I've, you know, if I forget anything, please add to my introduction. Um, uh, first of all, to Dr. Carrie Clark, she is the past president of the American Cannabis Nurses Association. She uh, serves as director of nursing, chair of the medical cannabis certificate program and faculty in the medical cannabis and holistic nursing programs at Pacific College of Health Sciences. She is the immediate past president of the American Cannabis Nurses Association, as I said, and has been a nurse since 1994 with a wide practice background, including experience within the acute care setting, pediatrics, hospice care, and parish nursing. And, um, you, uh, Dr. Clark has presented of, at many national and local conferences, particularly with onco oncology and holistic nurses, where she focuses on bringing basic knowledge about the endocannabinoid system and medi medicinal use of cannabis. And uh, Dr. Clark remains committed to including the, endo the endocannabinoid system in every nursing curriculum in the world. Yeah, I think that's about it. And uh, have I missed anything? That sounds good. Carrie? <laughs> sounds good. like a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, we might even, yeah, maybe even go to the detail because it's really fascinating, both of your, uh, you know, bios. Um, now let's go to Eloise, um, sorry, Eloise, yeah, Eloise Tyson. You are the, uh, Eloise is the current uh, president of the American Cannabis uh, um, Nurses Association, Association. she's co-founder and the chief visionary officer of Radical Health. Is that how you pronounce it? Or, mm -hmm. yep. okay. And prior to that, prior to Radical Health, Eloise founded Green Health Consultants, a medical cannabis clinic that helped patients use cannabis to help treat chronic and age-related illness. Eloise was one of the first healthcare practitioners to bring a clinical dosing regimen to the cannabis space, and she has treated more than 5,000, I think even I read some there, about approximately 6,000 patients using cannabis. There are very, uh, there are very few healthcare pr practitioners in the United States with a comparable level of cannabis expertise and experience. Eloise previously served on the board of American Cannabis Nurse Nurses Association from uh, 2014 to 2016 and in 2015 helped in the development of ACNA's uh, first online core curriculum for nurses bringing over eight hours of edu educational content as well as continuing education credits for nurses. Through Radical Health, Eloys continues to develop continuing cannabis education for healthcare professionals. She has precepted over 25 nurse practitioner students with who have shown a special interest in cannabis medicine. 
and you both have you know published in a you know bunch of uh, magazines but maybe you can go into detail about that um, what I'm really impressed uh, to be honest with you is your because uh, that's what I love uh, is your integral holistic approach to you know healing health um, yeah uh, Carrie, maybe why don't you just start off? Have I missed anything? Have I left out anything? Or any, anything in regards to cannabis or medical cannabis uh, that is, you know, maybe also from your personal perspective should be important to emphasize? Well, I think you know you certainly covered a lot there just reading our bios. Um, <laughs> so I think we're both, you know, really passionate about defining what nurses' role and nursing's role is in the medical cannabis movement. Uh, I think we're both really passionate about education for nurses and advocacy for patients. Um, and I know we both have had different efforts that we've done around advocacy. I was very involved in my state of Maine here in the United States um, with helping to um, uh, the Yes on One movement, which was the movement to legalize adult use of um, cannabis, so beyond the medical use. And uh, my reason for supporting that is that I think it helps to end the stigma. I think it helps to move us closer to getting uh, cannabis out of our Schedule One scheduling in the United States, which keeps it federally illegal. Um, and I think it provides opportunities for people to use cannabis who maybe wouldn't use it or are using it in ways that perhaps are not the best, but we can begin to become more open uh, as we begin to accept cannabis as as part of what is in nature and can help us to heal uh, doesn't mean it doesn't have its side effects. So I think the advocacy port part is, is really important as well. Lois, what's your path? Yeah, my path. Yes. Um, well, I think Carrie did a really nice job of capturing how important it is to legalize cannabis at the federal level, at least here in the United States, you know, we definitely see a disproportionate amount of people of color still being prosecuted and arrested for cannabis use, even though um, white and black people use it at the same rate. So I think when we legalize it, it helps, like Carrie mentioned, reduce the stigma and, you know, stop creating this system where, you know, we continue to only have cannabis in the, you know, poor neighborhoods and, and perpetuate this, um, the stigma that, you know, it's, it's bad and people who use drugs are bad people. Because there's so many people that benefit from it. And we need that research to demonstrate, you know, different routes of administration and their effectiveness and different dosages and different cannabinoid profiles that can help patients and, you know, we're stuck right now in this, um, you know, schedule one status where we can't study it. And so, you know, we keep getting that same narrative of, well, there's just not enough research. And I don't think that people who are intimately involved in the industry understand that catch 22 right there. So um, legalization is really important. Um, you know, we legalized cannabis in 2016 here in California after being a medical state for 20. Um, 20 almost 20 years at that point we're at 22 years now and it's definitely had its uh, you know set of challenges however um, we have seen more people accept it and consider trying it and because I work with the older population I think it's such an important uh, medicine for them to explore to help improve their quality of life and allow them to age in place and have some relief where other treatments typically don't help them yeah, we still have to go a long way. I mean, you know, the irony is that I see, um, of, you know, of all the countries where uh, where actually prohibition started off in the United States under Anslinger, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, racist, whatever uh, motives and stuff, you know, in the early 20th century. And of all the countries, it's, it's, it's still an irony that there's uh, more progress, more development, more, let's say, liberalization or legalization going on, even maybe even though fragmented and, you know, in different states, you know, different, uh, there's no federal unified law. I get that. But uh, let me just tell you about Austria and in European Union, it's so perverted because, uh, you know, it, during this, in the course, in the process of this legalization wave everywhere on this planet, um, now it's been verified. There is reports out there where it's been submitted to the European Commission that uh, instead of, you know, trying to 
legalize medical cannabis for patients and we are we, we have like in austria 1.5 million chronic pain patients all right mm -hmm. i just talked to the chairman of the um of the by the way to, to chairman um of the uh protection uh, consumer agency or or uh, yeah association and he's himself a pain patient and a in a in a in a you know patient and, and user of cbd right mm -hmm. so now the pharmaceutical industry the pharmaceutical lobby and that's verified are trying to push for the prohibition of cbd you know wow. like right now you know the who is actually even it's been a while you know that they've each actually recommended i mean you know the who you know where we know you know where they get the funding from i mean this is surprising me even but they're saying you know first of all reclassification of cannabis and more you know medical research and funding you know and sort of and now the, we are going actually more into the you know back to the middle ages you know like mm -hmm. uh, not forward looking but we're going backwards so it's this whole pervert perverted situation we have and that's why i thought it's it's really important to have this talk with you and and would love to you know hear your thoughts like what can we learn because i i, I really i'm totally jealous of your website because you seem to be <laughs> no not only your website but you know how you organize yourself it's such a unified voice and it's yeah. brilliant what you do the ethos the resolution that you put out uh you know your holistic approach and mm -hmm. What is, what is your position on that? Either one of you. That's great. Go ahead, so, Craig. Uh, so I think that's really unfortunate that that's happening there. Um, it makes me feel kind of sad and mad um, that people are suffering because they don't have access to this medicine. Um, sort of as a contrast to what's going on over there in Austria. So Mexico, for instance, has stated that access to um, cannabis is a human right because we have this endocannabinoid system and we have this medicine that can help us to heal. It is therefore a human right for people to access it. And then of course we have Cam Canada where it's completely federally legal now as well. Uh, so, you know, I'd be very, very concerned um, in your country. I wasn't aware that they were moving toward wanting CBD to be um, completely removed from people being able to access it. Um, I know here what has been helpful for many of us is to, you know, find out who your ally is, reach out to those organizations, who's in support of this, who at sort of that federal or congressional level um, would be someone who's going to listen to you and support you and help bring your, your voice forward. Um, and really seeing if you can kind of also combine some of those efforts with other organizations as well uh, to create that sort of unified voice that you're, you're looking for. And, you know, it's really challenging because of all of the stigma still. Um, when I stood for, um, people contacted my work, people asked that I be fired, people asked if, if my work had the same position that I have. Uh, I had colleagues that were like, you are doing the wrong thing, but I knew I was doing the right thing. Um, so I think being really clear on sort of what your stance is, uh, knowing who else is in your corner and um, can help move things forward or prevent things from going backward like it sounds they are, um, is going to be really important. And I think at this point too, it's great that you reached out to us and you know, sort of what other organizations that might be in other countries that might be interested in supporting your work that you're doing in your country as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I think those are really good points, Carrie. I mean, the stigma is so alive and well that even our colleagues make fun of us and shun us and, you know, call us names like potheads and drug dealers and, Seriously. you know, it's, um, oh yeah, God. you know, I mean, you really do. I've had to learn to get tough skin over the years. And I think the value of, you know, the American Cannabis Nurses Association, we're almost 1400 members strong now across the United States. And we do have some members in Australia and the United Kingdom and even Canada. And, you know, our position really is around education and collaboration and research and advocacy. And you cannot get into this industry without being an educator or an advocate. Um, 
you know, we're really trying hard here in the United States to bring more education and awareness to the politicians, the ones that are making these decisions for us. Um, I'm excited to announce that the CDC was looking for input from healthcare professionals about pain management and alternative options. And I approached them to speak on cannabis as an option for pain management and I've been selected. So I will have um, 45 to 60 minutes to speak with them on September 4th and really wanna highlight the barriers that uh, really prevent not only our patients who are in chronic pain, but also us as clinicians who um, aren't even allowed to consider this as an option because of drug testing and the, you know, the repercussions that happen as a result of that. Um, we really need to dig deep into the stigma and undo a lot of these, you know, challenges that we have, because the truth is that people are using it. So it's our job to really make sure that they're safe and they're getting safe access and it's effective and they're not, um, you know, getting these products all over the internet that are potentially harmful. And, and that's just what's going to happen in Austria if, if they prohibit it. It doesn't mean people stop using it because you prohibit it. We know that, right? <laughs> yeah. No. We've got a critical mass of, of, of regular cannabis users. I mean, we don't know how many, maybe it's 300,000, 500,000 users of 8 million people who regularly, mm. you know, uh, or once in a while they, they use it, they consume it. So, you know, you, you never, you can never, so you're right, you know, the stigmatization, the, the fear of stigmatization, the criminalization, and then on top of that, you've got the heavy, heavy hardcore lobbying. What, you know, mm -hmm. going, what's going, you know, if you just knew what's going on, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, the Ministry of Health, you know, the government, let's just say, you know, put out uh, this, this, they said, okay, make a report. So they made a report and they, they brought in all these so-called experts. Now, afterwards, mm -hmm. you, f you find out that all these experts or, or even medical doctors, they are super tight, you know, with a, bio, uh, with a pharmaceutical company called uh, Bionoric or Bionorica. And there's this monopoly in Austria who can actually, you know, grow real like THC uh, cannabis mm -hmm. plants, and then they sell them to Germany where they extract, you know, make this whatever, you know, synthetic uh, derivatives of, of uh, CBD, and then they sell it back to Austria. So it's a totally insane situation and where even the politicians of the opposition party says, where are all the reports, you know, the testimonials of the patients themselves, of the doctors, of the advocates, they're missing. So they're mm -hmm. either pretending to be stupid or they're really stupid or totally ignorant or, <laughs> you know, or just literally bought by the pharmaceutical industry and, you know, surprise, I mean, right? <laughs> I think it's ignorance. And I think there's a lot of well-meaning advocates on both sides. I mean, I definitely see in the cannabis industry where a lot of well-meaning advocates will get upset if uh, clinicians, for example, bring any kind of attention to negative impacts around cannabis. Um, for example, you know, I do see THC causes depression. Uh, we have seen something called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And the cannabis community will will sometimes um, fight with within itself when when you see these being brought up. And I think that if we don't do our due diligence and highlight, you know, some of these concerns that we may have, you know, the risks, the benefits, um, we can't go out there and promote that cannabis is this end all be all cure all with you know no pot potential harms to it. We really do need to study it and understand it, and um, people deserve that but we just get stuck in these old narratives. And, you know, when I got into the industry, I, you know, I started to recognize that prohibition didn't happen because the medical community thought something was wrong with cannabis. It was political, right? So, you know, we have been taught in nursing school primarily that cannabis is a drug, you know, of, um, of abuse. We're not taught about the end of cannabinoid system or cannabinoids yeah. or any of the benefits. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's one of changing, the, though. exactly. That's one of the doctors I talked to actually two doctors who were in uh, doctors of gynecology and, you know, for women's health. And she said they and all the doctors tell me that they, they never learned anything about the endocannabinoid system. They don't. I mean, I mean, is that really like deliberately left out of the textbooks or medical books? Well, so it's been, you know, about well, over 20 years, 26 years, something since we really started to have good knowledge around the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a while for 
there to be changes, but I think it's also still linked to the stigma with cannabis mm -hmm. and a lot of reluctance to add a whole new body system. It's the largest receptor system in our body. It's really one of the master regulators of our body. It supports homeostasis. And yet there's sort of this reluctance because of the stigma to really start talking about it, to include chapters in textbooks. Um, so one of the issues that I see in nursing is that um, there's a lack of education of all of the educators out there, thousands of educators who haven't been educated about this. So then how will they educate those incoming nursing students if they don't have the knowledge and the tools? And then there's also a lack of baseline education for students coming into nursing school. We don't talk about the endocannabinoid system in regular anatomy and physiology. So they don't get it as an actual body system before they come in um, as, as student nurses either. So um, American Cannabis Nurses Association took a stance on this that that this should be included, the endocannabinoid system and medicinal cannabis in every nursing program. And then the National Council of State Boards of Nursing here in the United States uh, in 2018 also made a stance that it should be included as well. Um, unfortunately, even though that was over two years ago, you know, things are still really slow to change. Um, and looking at some data that myself and um, Rachel Parmalee, who's also involved with ACNA, um, as one of our um, directors at large and secretary. Uh, so she and I collected data around nursing students and um, they're not getting the education in their academic settings. So they're going on the web, they're talking to patients. So those are kind of the two main places that nursing, our future nurses are learning about this from finding stuff on the web that's probably inaccurate because 90% of the cannabis information out there is inaccurate. And then um, talking to patients, learning from patients. And it's great to learn from patients. But on the other hand, our patients want this information from us. So um, I'm also really pleased that we, we have um, a textbook that's coming out called uh, Cannabis, a Handbook for Nurses. It should be out by the end of the year or beginning of 2021. Uh, I'm the editor of that. Eloise has a chapter in there um, from the uh, uh, nurse practitioner or APRN role, the advanced practice nursing role. Um, and it's nine chapters. It covers the endocannabinoid system, pharmacology, the history around prohibition, the nurse's role, ethics and advocacy, uh, a whole chapter just on CBD, a whole chapter just on research. So we're hopeful that this will be a tool um, that nurses uh, in academia can use to begin this educational process, to begin to thread the idea of the endocannabinoid system and medicinal cannabis across all of our curricula. Um, but it's still going to take some time. Um, and it's going to take them as well going, you know, to their biology department and saying, you've got to add into your anatomy and physiology class this endocannabinoid system so that students come in and they're prepared. So. Uh, we definitely still have a lot of work to do, but I think we're making progress. So, wow, that yeah. sounds fantastic. As I said, you know, I think in the United States also, you know, in other countries like Canada, I mean, they've legalized it totally, right? They, I think, they had even yep. to withdraw from the single convention of 1961, which is the essential problem. You know, we are still right. in this single convention 1961, and then what I also read on, uh, of course, it's about uh, th that's why. I mentioned the resolution that you um, you wrote on uh, or you have on your web website resolution regarding the proper scheduling of cannabis in the U.S. Controlled Substances Act of 1970, and the purpose is to reiterate the ACNA uh, uh, support for patient uh, access to whole plant cannabis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what's so funny? Um, uh, we, we we are observing that more and more older people, like really like older generation who, you know, who know still what was the, the uh, you know, the situation like in the early 20th century with, with all kinds of substances, you know. So they're coming into the grow shops because they have no other choice, you know, and, and the grow shop, uh, you know, people, they can't really, they're not even allowed. First of all, they're not allowed, but, you know, uh, so that they're seeking advice because they have no other way to go. You know, they can't go to the doctors because they're with one foot into the, you know, in the criminal law. It's really schizophrenic, this whole situation. So this is why, you know, I was really looking forward to talking to you because I'm like, 
um, maybe we can uh, somehow brainstorm together what could be an effective way to you know to have an impact you know uh, it's, it's still these voices are still you know there's this group and that group and there's even an ex cop who is like totally against against the war on drugs with whom i'm going to interview in the next few weeks so there's you know in different mm -hmm. fields of of expertise there are people you know coming out or law enforcement against prohibition in the united states so we've got all these people doctors and and even judge a judge in germany is like totally written a book about it so there seems to be, I mean, the sentiment has changed, you know, the stigma is still here, but the sentiment somehow has changed. What's, what, what is your perspective I mean, on that opposition? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's, I mean, it's okay. I love it. I, uh, you know, the best advice I got early on was act local, think global. It still works, right? Um, you know, we can get sort of, I think, ahead of ourselves in some way of, of when you see the disparities among the different, you know, globally, when you see the different disparities, and even within the United States, where we have, you know, 33 states plus the District of Columbia who have some sort of medical cannabis program. I mean, you know, the majority of the United States feels that cannabis has medicinal value. So you, you get to this point where you get really frustrated, but locally really trying to educate you know, clinicians and trying to educate the public and trying to educate, you know, the politicians, I think are really important. I also have really tried to empower my patients because they're the ones that are leading the change right now. They're the ones that, you know, go to their clinicians and say, nothing's working for me. Um, and, you know, I was at the pool with Betty Lou and she's taking CBD. And so I want to try it. And, you know, so you've seen this shift now where patients are advocating for themselves. But again, you're right. I mean, we still have this, this gap of clinician, provider um, support and education, right? So they do have to go often to the retail stores to purchase their products and they may not get good, adequate information at that time, which of course means they're unsuccessful. Um, my biggest push right now is that I want some sort of coverage, you know, whether it's for CBD um, or coverage insurance to cover a cannabis clinician's visit so that they have the same access to um, this kind of medical information that they do for other treatment options because right now it's all out of pocket. So they may try it once because they've made an investment of a couple hundred dollars and they don't have any more money to invest and to continue to explore it. And it's, it's, I mean, they can have access to their pain management doctors to explore every kind of opioid you can think of, or they can work with their psychiatrist to explore every kind of antidepressant you can think of. And it's, you know, usually very low cost to them. It's just, um, it's got to change, <laughs> you know, yeah. so. The yeah. issue with the costs is is really a huge problem because that's that's going to, if they really achieve you know prohibiting CBD, I mean it, it it will be extremely expensive if patients have to have to pay for themselves whether it's in euro dollars. I mean it's going to be probably per month like could be like five hundred thousand for like you know average person out there. It's a lot of money. So this is the discussion mm -hmm. right now also going on like who's going to cover these costs? I mean, do you need like a special, you know, a special grant, you know, special access to the chief doctor, or whatever of the, of the, you know, public insurance company here in Austria, where, you know, he signs it off if you're eligible or not. So it's, I don't know, it's a really difficult situation we have, you know, with, with patients. I, I love the idea of the uh, think global and act local. Mm -hmm. I think that is super important. You know, even things like, uh, having a little conference, having get-togethers with people that are interested in the same thing, um, getting people to read book like, Yo I don't know if you've read Johan Hari's um, Chasing the Scream, um, The End of the Days of the War on Drugs. So that's a great book. Uh, it's easy to read. Uh, you may find that it infuriates you like it does me, <laughs> um, but it goes through all the history of prohibition and really kind of lays out this found work of how it's based in racism and how it really all came from the United States. And, um, you know, it's time to end that. Yeah. But finding people that can come together locally, whether it's a book club like that, whether it's having a small conference with speakers um, or even a larger conference, uh, getting the message out on the airwaves, going to news stations, 
um, all these kinds of things, looking for groups that, that might be willing to come together. I think that is an issue when we end up with like disparate groups that are kind of working all for the same thing, but everyone kind of has their own thing in it. And then of course it's very easy for our egos to get in the way. So what are some common commonalities across those groups and what might attract them all to come to one thing, like a conference with speakers from, um, you know, it might be a virtual conference now. I'm not sure how you're doing over there with uh, the COVID-19, but um, we're pretty much all virtual conferences over here, but getting people to come together and hear those voices um, and to think, you know, like, what can I do? Who can I reach out to? And really encouraging people to, to be leaders. I think we see this in nursing, but perhaps it goes over into the general population as well that people think, oh, I'm not a leader. I can't do much. And I really try and empower people that, yes, you, you are a leader. You have a voice. You can reach out to others. You can express yourself um, and you can make a difference, right? We can all make a difference. And I think that's really important and that we don't get caught in this idea of sort of like, you know, it's kind of us against them and, um, you know, that things will never change because things are, are in reality always changing. So. Right. Right. Now, I totally agree with you that, uh, you know, the patients themselves, because, you know, I mean, we, we always talk about democracy, but I mean, what is democracy? If we have 1.5 million chronic pain patients, they should get together and, you know, get over their fears and, and express, you know, their desires, their, their, you know, what, what they really need, you know, and um, I wish it wasn't that, you know, uh, I don't know what to call it. Is it is it fear? Is it uh, too? I mean, it's also maybe a mentality thing. <laughs> maybe people in Austria are a little bit more conservative and you know reserved and. Uh... Well, pa patient groups can be really powerful and really work toward advocacy. Here in Maine, um, one of our strongest adv advocacy groups is actually the caregivers. So we have caregivers that can grow uh, medical cannabis for patients. They can grow for five patients and then they can um, grow for what's called a rotating patient. So they could have a patient that's not like always their patient, but they have a medical card so they can access um, cannabis that way. And that group has been um, extremely vocal and at our legislature, you know, all the time when the legislature is in session and, you know, very concerned about the future of cannabis, um, particularly medical cannabis now that uh, we're moving toward this state of legalized cannabis, kind of a catch-22 there. We don't want to, we want to legalize to end the stigma, but we don't want to lose the medicinal aspects. So, right. right. Yeah. The problem is really the, uh, we don't even have like a, you know, partial, some kind of, like in Netherlands, you know, they have, it's not really yeah. legalized. It's sort of a, what do you call it? Tolerance politics, right? Yeah. It's sort of a corporation, but it's still, you know, pretty advanced. I mean, it's a corporation between the justice system, police, uh, the, whatever, the mayor of different cities. I mean, I've been there. It's, 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 it works, you know, I mean, when uh, yeah. people are always concerned about like, oh, what about, you know, protecting the youth? Actually, there are coming more and more studies out that actually shows the number of consumers, whether it's in Portugal, the United States or wherever, it's going actually down with the uh, decriminalization or legalization or regulated uh, decriminalization. So, yeah, so that's the problem. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, my girlfriend has a grow shop and she, she can, uh, uh, she's an expert on that, but she, she can, you can sell legally plants, like little plants that have like less than 0 0.2, 0 0.3 THC. I mean, it's really ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is why, you know, we, we, we created this platform because, you know, we can't go on like this. I mean, people are seeking help and advice, but we have to, you know, we have to, we have to just, uh, you know, uh, reject them actually. You know? Yeah. And I think, you know, I don't know if it's fear among the, the chronic pain patients, but I, I think in some ways, at least here in the United States, that they sort of become products of their environment, meaning they, you know, they're on these medications that don't really work for them and they're, they're constantly um, increasing the doses or adding them on and you see what we call polypharmacy and before you know it, they have all these additional side effects of depression and anxiety and, um, you know, some post-traumatic stress around it and, and, and they just, um, I think they become isolated easily. Chronic pain patients can be, I think that they can feel um, as though they're drug seeking, that they're being labeled, you know, even when 
they're getting their medications regularly, prescription form. So I think that we, we treat them poorly and I don't think they know how to advocate advocate for themselves. And I think that's what you know the, the role of the clinician really needs to be right now is showing up in these um, in any opportunity we have to advocate for them. I mean, that's what we, we did locally here. We had uh, 60 of our patients show up to a city council meeting that went on until 1.30 in the morning because everybody had to have their two minutes up at the, um, and you know, at the time it felt like it was a waste of time because we made no progress in terms of access. Um, and here we are four years later in my city and they're just now going to allow for a dispensary shop to open up. So, you know, it takes time and it can be, you know, the effort sometimes can be exhausting, but that's part of the advocacy piece where we just have to keep pushing forward and trying really hard to, to demonstrate mm. the value of, of cannabis. Yeah. You know, what's really um, um, surprising, I mean, not surprising, but uh, patients, I mean, there's just, a, first of all, there's just a handful of doctors who are specialized on, on CBD or, you know, cannabinoids. So I talked to one of the doctors here in Vienna, uh, whom I know pretty for a long time now, because, it, um, and and so he, he, he told me that uh, some of the patients come, come to him and say, you know, doctor, it's it's really great what you're giving me, you know, this durabinol, this sort of extracted CBD. Yeah, it works, but the real stuff, it works much more, you know, mm-hmm. by order of magnitude better, you know, first of all, uh, from, you know, it's more effective. And, w- and what you also, talk, it's really important to talk about the side effects of all these conventional medicine. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. once people, I think, understand and, and comprehend, you know, the difference before and after, uh, I think it's going to become sort of a paradigm shift in, in people's thinking, right? Not only in patients, but maybe in the general public, in, you know, in the general circle of doctors. You would hope. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I don't know that I, um, you know, it's interesting when you look at, you know, the FDA approved cannabinoids here, you know, and how they interact with the cannabinoid system. And you're right, I get the same thing. Well, yes, I I was prescribed dronabinol, which is a THC synthetic derivative, and it wasn't effective. And, you know, now I'm starting to see cancer patients who are placed on this dronabinol, which is incredibly expensive. It's like a thousand dollars a month for them to have 2.5 to 5 milligrams of THC. And I have a patient right now who has schizoaffective uh, disorder who is placed on Marinol. And she's actually at high risk for, you know, depression and suicidal ideation on dronabinol. Like she should be on cannabis. Um, She should be on the plant because it's a partial agonist at CB1, whereas dronabinol is a full agonist. And that's where you have these potential increased side effects that can be really um, harmful to patients. And, you know, it's like the other nurse practitioner and the physician are like, what? You know, when you try to talk to them about this is a contraindication. Oh, it's just THC. Um, Yeah, but it's the wrong kind of THC. So it's it's planting these seeds, but it does take a long time to water them and get them to grow and and to see change. I really liked your example, Eloise, where you um, were talking about just in your local town and uh, the practitioners brought the patients there. Uh, I think that's a great example of empowering the patients to be advocates, um, creating environments where they can be together and where it's safe because there's a lot of them together. Um, and then being led by the practitioners, I think that's just a really great example of what Kevin is, is headed toward here with how do we create this change? And then this idea that it takes time and it takes effort. And I think we have to think of these things as more of a marathon and less of a sprint. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why you know so many of us are committed and we realize like, this is a commitment that's going to be years and perhaps over our lifetimes um, of work to really create the sort of change we need to see so that patients do not have to be suffering in the way that they're suffering now. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all these, let's say regulatory legal, you know, positive pressures that are coming up from Canada, Uruguay, Portugal, Czech Republic. I mean, 
I would have I would have expected that this would accelerate the process, you know, but you think it's going to take longer. And because I thought, you know, even in Austria, they can't even whatever, you know, conservative attitude there is or, or you know, or uh, stigmatization. But I think they can't with, withstand the pressure, you know, one day that that's that was my expectation. <laughs> Maybe I'm too optimistic. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think optimism is still good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's how I keep myself good. alive, yeah. Yeah, I thought when Canada went, you know, uh, federally legal, that we would be right behind them, and we're not. And, um, you know, but when then when I look back at the 50 states and where we were 10 years ago yeah. and where we're at today, I see a lot of progress. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of also like how do you measure that progress and where are we headed? And we have at least three bills at the federal level right now um that are all out in committee so they may end up sort of what we call dying there um that are focused on legalization at the federal level so mm -hmm. um but you know at least they're there and they're introduced and beginning to create change we know that the majority of americans are supportive of medicinal use of cannabis anyway so um you know i think again that idea of it's it still is going to be some work uh and i think also for you in a very unique sort of setting you know looking at the countries around you as well what did they do what did it take in those kind of smaller countries to create change as well um i do like what you know amsterdam and portugal have done moving toward that decriminalization and or tolerance i'm sorry not answer yeah it's a that's a whole country amsterdam is a city <laughs> sorry, sorry, a little ignorant there but i do know that uh, but anyway. <laughs> um you know i think portugal is a great example yeah. of just you know like just decriminalize it get rid of the black market get rid of this whole like oh it's like so bad and we're gonna you know people have been looking for ways to alter their consciousness and have been altering their consciousness since forever. And for some reason, alcohol is totally acceptable, but everything is not. Yeah. Else yeah. Not, right. Totally so, schizophrenic. Yeah. yeah. You know, in Germany, they're much more, um, it's always said, you know, they're better organized uh, and, uh, you know, similar to you, you know, it's like the, the German hemp association, they're super organized. They have even their own, you know, super, you know, YouTube channel and a lot of followers and they, 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 you know, they do like, on a on a fact base uh on a fa factual basis they do uh are you know they they bring in the discussions and the reasoning in the parliament in the you know lawmaking process so and at least they you know made a little bit uh progress since 2017 patients under certain conditions they can go uh, with their uh, medical prescription to the pharmaceutical uh, store and get their real medicinal uh mm -hmm. cannabis uh, flowers, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a it's a drop on a hot stone, but, but, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You gotta start somewhere. I mean, if you wait for perfection, you'll wait too long. So it's, you know, just kind of getting out there and, and getting going and being adaptable and willing to, to change. I think it's hard because so many people have been in, in, in the issue for so long, it can get exacerbating after a while when you just see, I mean, just last year I gave a talk to um, <clears throat> uh, physicians at a hospital in Los Angeles. And I was told there's only going to be like four or five people, you know, that we never get a lot of people at these types of talks. It's like a lunch and learn. It was standing room only by the time I started my talk. And I had had this physician who was, um, had come up to me right before I, I gave my talk and started grilling me on things like, you know, I thought this caused schizophrenia and all of those myths and, um, you know, misconceptions that are out there, right? He just came at me and I just, you know, answered him the best that I could and then went on to do my talk and he started to harass me during the talk. Um, to the point where I just ignored him because he was very disruptive and he got very upset that I ignored him and he stood up in the middle of this room and yelled at me about how dare I come to this hospital and talk about a drug that's so dangerous and he stormed out of the room. Is... You know, and this is 2019. <laughs> wow. So, you know, um, you know, luckily I've, I, you know, I'm a seasoned enough 
um, speaker that it did not, you know, did not disrupt me. But I certainly afterwards was very just like, wow, that was bizarre. And I was, I was um, approached by about six different physicians in the room to reassure me that that was normal behavior of this person and it wasn't personal. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, so, you know, not to be a pessimist, you know, about leading the change and, and making change, but I do think that we, I've never seen people um, so attached to their beliefs uh, around cannabis than any other thing you know it's just it's like hardwired in their dna when they are you know anti-cannabis and sometimes even education is futile you know it's what we see is that when people or their loved ones need it is what that's what i've seen with some of my yeah. local politicians mm -hmm. is they've sent now that they know i'm there they send their family members to me and that's what's changed a lot oh. of that's what's made a lot of progress in our yeah. cities that their family members have benefited exactly because they see they feel the reduction in in pain in suffering right mm -hmm. i think this is, this is a, yep. a tremendous effect right right yeah definitely mm -hmm. that's that's a huge factor um, I was going to ask you something uh, about the, um, is there a preference in the uh, dose, uh, the administration of cannabis? Like, do people prefer to take it or does it depend like uh, on the, the illness or I don't know, on the, on the, on the specific disease or symptom or pain? Mm -hmm. Like, is it oil or in vaporizing or what is it that people prefer? It really depends. I mean, um, I don't know what you see, Carrie, but most people um, prefer inhalation. And even though I work with the uh, older population, they usually come to me saying they don't want to smoke it. It feels counterintuitive. Um, but we talk about the risks and benefits of the different routes. Inhalation is often a way for them to have the most control over their experience and to get relief the soonest. Um, if they're still feeling like inhalation is uh, not a good fit for them, I would say tinctures or oils mm -hmm. are probably the most popular, at least in the older population. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we hear a lot about medibles or edibles where mm -hmm. um, cannabis oil is used to make a product that someone can eat. And now we see it in everything from chocolates to gummies to sodas on popcorn, whatever. Um, but that is much harder to control for a lot of people um, mm -hmm. because you don't know about onset and absorption rates can really vary. Even the same product from day to day for a person, depending on what they've eaten and where they're at. Um, and I think even their circadian rhythms um, can really, it can really uh, affect them differently. So uh, even though people really like the idea of medibles or something delicious that has cannabis in it, you know, we, I think we always encourage, you know, to be very cautious with those to, and for everything to really start low on the THC and go slow as they're learning um, how it interacts with their body and kind of titrate up to a dose where um, they're having good relief from their um, symptoms. They don't necessarily have to feel high um, or intoxicated and uh, they're avoiding the side and adverse effects. So, uh, but yeah, I, I do see that people like to inhale because um, it is a more immediate effect and it feels a little bit more controllable. It wears off more quickly and then they can use the medicine again if they need to. And of course there are risks with that. And, um, you know, really important too that patients are accessing medicine that is safe and has been tested and is free of pesticides. So that they know what they're getting. Right. And in some places like Eloise is out in California, you know, going to a dispensary, a lot of that is available. Uh, they can actually see what's in the product they're getting. They know it's been tested. They know what the dosing is. And then in other states, maybe not so much. And there still is also, uh, even though we have quite a bit of legalization across the United States, there still is plenty of black market product out there. So. Which is which could be risky, right? Because you don't know yeah. what is inside there. You know, like a, what kind of herbicides, fungicides, or any kind of metals, or <laughs> I don't know. You know, any exactly right. Yeah. It's a quality. It's you can never verify. This is why legalization. You know, on top of that, is so important because yeah. you can you you can be sure you can, you can have a guaranteed right. quality, right? 
Right. I mean, can you imagine like, uh, you know, buying some kind of moonshine kind of alcohol product? I know people do still do this too, but like you have no idea what's in this product or people you know, that go to music festivals or whatever, like here's, here's, a, here's a tablet of something, go ahead and take it. Like you have no idea what's in that. It's extremely risky and it's still, can be the same way with cannabis as well. So that is a great point that it's really a safety issue and a health issue and patients deserve to know what they're getting. Right, sure. right. Yeah. Transparency. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's still, you know, I mean, this propaganda about gateway drug and, you know, I mean, how, how in the world are they gonna protect the youth? I mean, you know, I studied for 15 years the internal documents of the tobacco industry because that was my PhD work. I, I wrote, you know, books and my PhD thesis on, and it's unbelievable, you know, the strategies that the tobacco industry, the cigarette corporations have devised for the last, I don't know, you know, many for many decades, you know, and even they went into the strategy, like what if cannabis ever, you know, would be legalized, you know, so they had already worked out the strategy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I just find it interesting, you know, when we have like socially accepted drugs like alcohol and the highly manipulated and highly engineered cigarettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's uh, I don't know the um, the way it's being argued and and uh, discussed. It's really schizophrenic. So, yeah. So before we wrap up, um, thank you so much again for your time and for sharing your knowledge, your, your wisdom and and uh, do you have any like first of all where can people find you or any, any other like anything we can look out for collaborations maybe internationally with the american cannabis nurses association yeah there is the um cannabis uh, there's a group in the united uh, kingdom and i know they're called cpass and they do have a uh, nurse arm that they're um, working with, and let me give you another one. the Cannabis Patient Advocacy and Support Services out of the United Kingdom. They're working really hard to provide education, um, advocate for patients, and also educate nurses out in the United Kingdom. They have approached the American Cannabis Nurses Association about collaboration. Um, it's just something that we you know, we're a nonprofit organization. Things move a little slower than <laughs> we probably would like them to. But I could see um, opportunities for us to collaborate. There's also the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, which also has a European arm, and they have been working with the cannabis nurses to bring more attention to the work that we're doing in the in the industry. Carrie. Um. Yeah, and then from uh, from a different kind of perspective, so Pacific College of Health and Science, uh, where I'm the director of nursing and the chair of the medical cannabis program, uh, we actually have an academic certificate. Mm -hmm. um, so in in nursing in the United States, you can get board certifications, um, and ACNA is working toward eventually being recognized cannabis eventually being recognized as a specialty within nursing, but that will take um, probably a few more years worth of work. Uh, we have to work with some larger organizations uh, on the national level to get that recognition. So in the meantime, uh, we're fortunate to have this program where um, students can take eight credits of academic um, work and come out and feel very, uh, they won't necessarily be experts, but they'll be confident, they'll be comfortable, and that curriculum is open to um, nurses and doctors. We have chiropractors that come through it. We have massage therapists that come through it. Um, so uh, I think we, I don't think we, we may have had a few phar a pharmacists come through it, but anyway, so we've had uh, quite a few acupuncturists come through it. Um, and uh, Eloise and I also both teach in that curriculum. So great. Uh, we're excited to also kind of be creating the future and kind of an example of how you can educate healthcare professionals and get them to a level of confidence and feeling comfortable with being a, their own knowledge and with creating paths for how am I going to grow my knowledge? How am I going to advocate for my patients? How am I going to be part of this amazing change that's happening in medicine and healthcare? So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I see. I, I I truly see an evolution in 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 comprehension and in you know opening up uh, people's perception and, and consciousness. And 
I think it's going to happen maybe, you know, as you know, gradually and subtly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So thank you so much again. I really enjoyed our talk and yeah, maybe we can repeat this sometime in the near future. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. All thanks right. for having us. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. You too. All right. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.